Hello everyone and welcome to day 8 of Star Trek Tumblr 2016 and today is Star Trek's 50th birthday! Yay! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday dear Star Trek! Happy birthday to you! Yay! Alright, well, let's kick things off today with Patterns of Force. The Starship Enterprise arrives to the planet Ecos in the M43 Alpha system to investigate the disappearance of a Federation cultural observer named John Gill, who was one of Captain Kirk's history professors at Starfleet Academy. As soon as the Enterprise enters orbit around Ecos, it is attacked by a rocket armed with a, with a thermonuclear warhead, technology that is no match for the Starship, but too advanced to be from either primitive, more like Ecos, or their neighboring planet, the peaceful, more progressive Xeon. However, the latter has achieved intrasystem spaceflight and developed an interest in assisting their neighbor, resulting in a significant Zeonian population on Ecos. Sorry. Kirk suspects Gill may be responsible for the, for the introduction of more advanced technology somewhere in the system, which would mean that he has contaminated a cozy culture and hence violated the Prime Directive. Kirk and Executive Officer slash Science Officer Spock beam down to the plane to investigate. Before they transport to the surface, Kirk has Chief Medical Officer Dr. McCoy entered subcutaneous emergency transponders, a type of homing device, into the forums of each in the event they cannot use their communicators. Upon arrival, Kirk is back watching horror as the Xeon is arrested by Ecosian soldiers dressed as brown-shirted Nazi stormtroopers. Uh-oh. An outdoor video newsreel shows an Ecosian rally featuring huge, featuring huge crowds shouting Nazi-style slogans and swastika and blazing flags. A female Nazi officer, Daris, is shown receiving a Medal of Honor, the Iron Cross, second class. The final solution is mentioned, meaning apparently the extinction of all Xeons in Ecos, as a prelude to, this, to the entire destruction of Xeon. The broadcast ends with the reporter making a Nazi salute to a picture of the viewer, whom the shot Kirk recognizes as, recognizes as John Gill. Dun dun dun! Startled, horrified, and, de and determined and determined to contact Gill. Kirk and Spock steal uniforms and attempt to infiltrate the main headquarters, but are caught when Spock's ears are exposed. He and Kirk are tortured until party chairman Enig orders them thrown into a cell for further interrogation. There they meet Isaac, the Xeon prisoner they had seen arrested earlier. The trio quickly engineer an escape using rubidium crystals from Kirk and Spock's transponders as cutting torch lasers to retrieve their communicators. Isaac takes them to meet the underground resistance led by his brother Abram. Suddenly, their hideout is raided, led by Darius, in what is quickly revealed as a ruse to test the stranger's loyalty. Darius is actually a resistance member who has infiltrated the government. Abram explains that Deputy Fur Malakon is actually the de facto Kosian leader. In turn, Kirk and Spock explain the situation, the situation from their perspective and ask for help in locating Gil. To learn that the Fuhrer is, in fact, due to make a speech, that will eventually, that, that evening, that will officially launch the final solution. To gain entrance to the broadcast center, the group pretends to be a film crew. They find Gil in a, broadca in a broadcasting booth surrounded by guards, seemingly dazed but beginning his speech. Kirk has Dr. McCoy beamed down. He arrives in a cloakroom where the party is discovered by a security team led by Chairman Enig, who surprisingly does not seem to recognize them. After he leaves, Isaac explains that Enik was is also a resistance member. Sinking into the broadcast booth, McCoy confirms Gil is heavily drugged. He administers a counteractive stimulant while Spock uses a Vulcan mind melt on Gil, which confirms that Melicon was responsible for Gil's condition. Fairly coherent, Gil explains that he initially imposed a form of Nazism slash fascism upon the lawless Ecosians because he believed it to be the most efficient system of government ever devised. Spock and Kurz state that National Socialism enabled a defeated banker of Germany almost immediate governmental recovery to the level of near global domination. The system worked on Ecos until Melicon gained control and twisted it into a tool to wipe out Xeon. Kirk makes Gil aware of the extent to which Ecos ha has progressed toward resembling Nazi Germany. A horrified Gil, now lucid enough to speak his own mind, renounces the final solution, cancels the invasion of Xeon, and declares Melicon a traitor. Melicon grabs a submachine gun and opens fire on the broadcast booth, fatally wounding Gil. In retaliation, Isaac shoots Melicon twice, killing him instantly. Enigan Daris 
selfishly, re selfishly respected party leaders, go on the air instead to announce the end of the Nazi regime. Isaac thanks Kirk for Starfleet's help but asks them to leave, saying it is up to the two planets to rebuild themselves. After returning to the Enterprise, Spock expresses confusion as to how Gil can make such a mistake at emulating the Nazis. Kirk explains that the problem was not the Nazis themselves, but giving any one individual so much power. Kirk reminds Spock and McCoy, who are bickering, that they have been through one civil war, and bids them, let's not start another. Yeah, I agree with you there, Kirk. Well, a pretty interesting episode, and it's not that bad, really. I give Patterns of Force three warp cores out of five. Well, join me in a little bit for a look at the episode by any other name. So, until then, live long and prosper, everybody.